Good morning, everybody. Uh, we're about to start week six, uh, and I've got some uh, announcements to make, which uh, hopefully will make you happy, uh, although uh, it does call for a few changes. Uh, but I'm really thinking now in terms of uh, trying to reduce your workload a little bit more, uh, since you do have the research paper coming up and uh, kind of be due. Uh, the end of week seven, so uh, next, uh, not this Sunday, but the Sunday after. Uh, so let me go through with you quickly, and I'll try to, con I think I can get this out to you in an email too, I certainly should, and I will uh, get something to you on this. But uh, I, wanna, I want to uh, kind of recap where we are. Uh, as I've said, and you've heard me say before, and, and uh, I want to thank you for being very, very patient with me on this. Uh, it is a new course, and I am trying to tweak it into a way that uh, it doesn't overload you with work, and yet you hit the highlights of uh, uh, legal issues that management's going to deal with. So uh, if I look back on week five, you'll see that I didn't uh, didn't cover employment discrimination, and I'm going to dis discuss that and go over that today, and probably in more detail. We also have one for lecture, uh, consumer protection, and environmental law. And uh, I'm going to go over those uh, fairly briefly. Uh, those are the kinds of things where there's a number of laws involved. I, I'm not going to ask you to uh, memorize the laws, uh, but I may ask you to tell me what they're about. Uh, certainly not necessary for you to memorize the dates of the laws, but just basically what they're about. So and I'll hit that when we talk about it. Uh, the real cr uh, the real heart of the uh, lecture today is employment discrimination, which, uh, when I look at it, uh, it is probably one of the more significant topics for you to be aware of and for you to be prepared to handle in your work lives, uh, because it is uh, probably the major source of litigation between employers and employees. Uh, it is a major area where employees, uh, and, and very often you get uh, disgruntled employees, uh, will come after the employer for one thing or another. And managers need to know how to deal with those situations. They need to, to have their uh, antenna up if something goes on in the company and they, they get a sense that this is something that could be a problem. My experience has been both as a, as a businessman and in my own company where we had quite a few employees to being an attorney in-house counsel for a number of several companies uh, where we also had a large group of employees and uh, dealing with these matters and they happen uh, many times uh, they come out of nowhere uh, often because a lower level manager has let something uh, ev evolve into a bigger problem that would have been, been dealt with right away. So if anything uh, a little piece of advice that not in the book anywhere, and that is, from my experience, as for you as managers, uh, I can't emphasize enough that uh, the moment uh, you recognize or sense something's wrong between a couple of employees or an employee and a supervisor who might report to you, uh, or any employee issue uh, of any kind of discriminatory nature, uh, possible hostile work environment, uh, possible, you get a lot of problems nowadays with online pornography and distasteful jokes going around the, the office sometimes by email. Uh, if you get any hint of that, you must act immediately. Uh, either report it up to the line uh, quickly, or uh, if it's your responsibility, deal with it quickly. Uh, and that involves bringing the, pe the person in and talking to them. Uh, and, uh, Again, I just can't emphasize enough how critical it can be to you because uh, this employment litigation stuff arising out of hostile work environment, sexual harassment, employment discrimination of one kind or another uh, is expensive. Uh, it is uh, time consuming. Uh, it leaves a bad taste in everybody's mouth. And it's just a bad precedent to have happen in your company. So if you can handle it and Get it put to bed. I'll give you the I'll give you the the keys to looking at it. I'll, I'll give you the California law, which is very unforgiving, uh, and and 
I find troublesome, but it puts a big burden on the employer. Uh, and uh, you're just going to have to be very alert to it. Now, uh, getting back to uh, the assignments and so forth, in week five we had uh, agency law, we had employment relationships, and also discrimination. Uh, you'll recall that I uh, moved the number three quiz moved back because the quiz four got delayed by me. Um, I got pulled off in some legal issues that uh, gave me a lot of problems time-wise. But in any event, uh, that is now posted, uh, and I would ask you to uh, try to get that completed by the middle of uh, of next week. I think I said Wednesday or so, but uh, if you can get that done fine. If you need a special uh, dispensation for maybe a, a short time more, and I really don't want to go uh, beyond a day if necessary, but I'd like to stick with Wednesday. Excuse me, it's in the morning. I need my uh, caffeine to stay alert here. Um, then we can work with that because you've been uh, kind enough to work with me on some of this. Uh, my real goal is to hopefully out of this course you'll get a few uh, ideas and a few uh, methods that you can deal with some of these issues that pop up in the law that affect your business and affect you as a manager. In any event, uh, to get down to it here. Uh, so we're going to talk about discrimination. Now, for week six, we have our reading assignments, consumer protection law and environmental law. Uh, they are short chapters. However, they're chalked with statutes, that sort of thing. As I look at them again, uh, I see in the syllabus I've asked you to outline those and submit the outlines to me. And I'm going to withdraw that request. I'm going to have you delete that from the assignment for this week. So uh, I would like you to, to uh, con uh, read consumer, the consumer, consumer Protection Chapter. I'd like you to read the Environmental Law Chapter. They're not lengthy. Uh, when I went through them and yellow marked the highlights, it's, there's not a, a lot to be marked up. Um, as I said, I just hit the key parts that tell you what they're all about. Uh, if you take uh, environmental law, there's just basically clean air, clean water, and anti-pollution. Excuse me. So uh, anyway, I don't want you to bother uh, outlining those two chapters nor submitting anything to me. Now, on the other hand, because when I look at the last quiz, which is going to be uh, quiz three, which as I mentioned to you, I'm going to move that back to the eighth week, again because you have the research paper to do, which I'm hoping you'll be able to set enough time aside to give me a good work product there. That, that can be really helpful in the grade if, if uh, that's a major goal for you. Um, so what I am going to ask you to do, though, is to outline uh, chapter 23, uh, which is the, uh, I'm sorry, 22, which is the uh, employment discrimination chapter. And the reason that I'm asking you to do that is because I think it's so important uh, and the learning uh, uh, that comes from outlining, I think, is in my mind, there's no question. You get a little more learning out of it uh, when you write down what you just read. And also, it'll use uh, be a good study guide because the uh, quiz, the third quiz, will emphasize this. So I want you to know I'm going to emphasize uh, chapter 22, employment discrimination. So I'd also like you to outline it, and I'd like you to submit that to me. So uh, in terms of the submission on the outlining of it, uh, I would like to have that by by Sunday. Uh, I'm looking at it from the standpoint that uh, hopefully you, you read it or got into it for uh, week five. So hopefully it's just a review matter. If not, uh, I'd like you to read it, outline it, and submit the outlines to me by next Sunday. Uh, which is when the outlines would have been done for consumer due for consumer protection and environmental law. Okay, so we're going to make those changes at this point. Uh, the other thing too is is that in a quiz, uh, I'm and I'll give you more detail, kind of a study guide because I, I again I want to try to alleviate a little bit of the work if I can. I want to alleviate uh, you having to think you've got a, a, a overwhelming bunch of stuff to do here at the end of the. Semester, although it does, or the, or the period, I'll know it, I know it does get the uh, crunch time for you. Uh, but um, I'll send out a little study guide at some point, uh, maybe the seventh week, uh, or even early eighth week, uh, uh, telling you what uh, what chapters are going to be dealt with. So, and and by the way, I'm not going to 
uh, give you a whole bunch of questions on a quiz. You know they're pretty short anyway, but uh, I'm not going to give you a whole bunch of questions on uh, on land use control and that sort of thing. Okay. Now that takes me over to seven because I know you like to plan ahead, and, and believe it or not, I, I try to plan ahead too. And all these things I've got going on, as I know you do in your work, but uh, if you look at the syllabus in week seven, uh, I'm going to also eliminate the reading of chapter 26, which deals with land use control. And that also called for an outline. So we're going to get rid of the outline. Uh, we're going to get rid of chapter 26. I'm trying to give you, free you up to have more time to work on your, uh, on your research paper, because I'm sure, and I'm the same way, a lot of times just by virtue of other demands, you, you kind of put it off to the last minute. So. Uh, let's get it, get rid of chapter 26, give you more time. Also, uh, there's no need to outline uh, chapter 27, the antitrust and monopoly chapter, chapter 27. So no need to outline that, but I will ask you to read it. And uh, again, with the study guide, I'll give you a few uh, hints as to the areas that I would like you to focus on. But I'm not going to ask you to study in depth the whole chapter, but I do want you to read it. So read chapter 27, no need for an outline and then do not bother reading chapter 26, which deals with land use control. So those are gone. Those are out. Uh, so I hope that's going to help you out there. Uh, so that's where we stand for now. Uh, I also mentioned in my email that uh, we've lost a number of class members, and so it's now not going to be possible for me to do the uh, group presentations that I wanted to do. And my, my overall strategy when I designed the course was is that we do the research papers, get those out of the way by the end of week uh, seven, and then you'd have a week to work, do a little reading, and then work on uh, work on a presentation. But I again, I'm trying to cut it back, uh, lighten up a little bit as we get towards the end. Uh, so I'm going to come up with a an exercise, and we're dealing with Sarbanes-Oxley corporate governance. Very important, uh, very important to manage for managers to understand. What uh, what's that all about, and the background of it, and what went on, uh, and I and it's uh, so I'm going to end up uh, probably assigning you a company that was involved in these scandals, and have you research that company, and then do me a little short three-page paper on it, and uh, and what would be slides uh, if you were going to present it, uh, what kind of slides would you put together to present it, and and if you ask me, uh, the slides involved, uh, I've had students actually do this in a formal presentation in the classroom, and uh, they may come up with uh, four, five, six, seven slides, something like that. And, and you know, obviously, they're just going to be bullet points or make the major points. So I probably would just have you send those to me uh, along with that. So that's kind of on the horizon for week eight, OK? So uh, let's see how much time I've used here. We are into uh, 13 minutes. And uh, so let me get started on employment discrimination. And, and this is a very current topic, and it's a topic that uh, um, I think you get your teeth into because it's uh, it, you see it every day in your workspace. And uh, we've the, the country and the congresses and the state legislatures have gone into some depth uh, to try to level the playing field in the area of employment uh, for everybody in the country as best they can. And that's what this chapter is all about. Let me take you back quickly, if I can do anything quickly, um, to how this all really, really began. And uh, if you go back, the first Civil Rights Act, this all comes out of the Civil Rights Movement. And the first Civil Rights Act, believe it or not, was in 1866. So a year after the Civil War, uh, Congress passed the first Civil Rights Act. And the idea was, of course, to to try to deal with discrimination against the, the newly freed slaves, the black African American blacks uh, in the country who had been freed by virtue of the war. Uh, and so we had that uh, statute, but as you know from your history, the South re re uh, fought that tooth and nail, uh, did everything they could to prevent it from really having a, a real impact. And the result was is that very little went forward from 1886, almost 100 years, uh, until uh, the early 1960s when uh, Martin Luther King came, King, King came along. Uh, and when I, when I look at uh, uh, a speech, um, you know, I look at speeches, 
I think the Gettysburg Address is a thing of beauty if you read it. Uh, it takes all of about four or five minutes when you stop and think about what Abraham wrote. And, and incidentally, as and I, I, I went to Gettysburg College with a battle was fought, and a Civil War buff, and uh, so I've done a lot of reading, and I'm quite interested in the Civil War and Lincoln. And uh, uh, and he wrote that speech uh, supposedly on the back of an envelope or several envelopes on the train while he was. Uh, traveling down to uh, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, which is, or up to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, which is about, I think, maybe an hour, an hour's drive from Washington, D.C. up to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, which is in the southern part of Pennsylvania. As you know, Pennsylvania is a kind of a, a rectangle, and, and Gettysburg is just above the uh, Maryland uh, line, state line. And uh, he traveled up there, and he, and he wrote this, he wrote the Gettysburg Address, not a whole lot of line outs if you look at the so uh, it just flowed from his heart and flowed from from his his love for the country and, and his commitment to to trying to prevent the union from being dissolved uh, he was also not the key, keynote speaker you may know some of this but i thought it might be interesting uh, the keynote speaker whose name i don't recall spoke for i believe somewhere between an hour and two hours so almost like me when i do these lectures i guess but he spoke for uh, almost two hours. You look at the Gettysburg Address, if you ever read it, and you timed it, it can be read in about three minutes, three to four minutes, I think, at the outside. It is an absolute thing of beauty. Uh, what got me there was, is I also think an equally beautiful speech, and, and some of the major excerpts we hear about is Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech in, uh, in Washington, D.C., in the early 60s when the Civil Rights Movement got going. And if you uh, ever happen to read some of his speech, it is, it is in my mind, equally as moving uh, and as insightful as, as any speech I've heard by a major figure in our history. In any event, uh, you will recall that in uh, 1963, uh, uh, President Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas on November 22, 1963. And uh, uh, the vice president then was Lyndon B. Johnson from Texas, who was a Democrat and was pretty liberal, you know, having been a Southern Democrat who for many years turned to be, tended to be conservative. And using the uh, legacy and the legend of John Kennedy, he pushed through uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which was a response uh, to, uh, to a certain extent the Civil Rights Movement the assassination by a, a president who was viewed as being uh, close to the common man, close to uh, someone interested in minorities and, and equal opportunity and whatnot. And, and the Civil Rights Act got passed in uh, 1964. And all of this employment discrimination stuff comes under what's known as Title VII. So just recall the Civil Rights Act 64 as Title VII. And everything we're going to talk about comes under Title VII. Uh, uh, but you know, during this time too, we had other uh, laws passed to try to get to, to employment uh, equality as best we can. Uh, the Equal Pay Act was passed in 1963, which required equal pay for men and women. Uh, it's made strides, but if you read uh, more recent information, women still get paid about 75% of what mo of men do. It's just the way it's evolved, but it, it's getting better. Uh, and then also you had the Age Discrimination Act in 1967, which uh, stated that uh, employers could not discriminate against anyone, and they, and they set a mandatory age, and the age was 40. So anybody over 40, there's a presumption that you may have been discriminated against if you were let go from your job, or fired, or what have you, and there's not adequate documentation. Uh, in any event, uh, Here's what happened once the Civil Rights Act of 64 was passed. In 1972, Congress created the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission under the Equal Employment Opportunity Act. And the, it's called the EEOC. It started in 1972, has five members of the commission. And their job, is, and the agency's job, and it's fairly large, as you might imagine, most governmental agencies are grown like topsy. And its job is to receive complaints from employees over matters they think are discriminatory against them in the workplace. They receive nowadays anywhere from 
I think it runs 15 to 19,000 complaints a year. Uh, for a long time, the commission was just kind of eyewash. And uh, then in, uh, in the 80s, can't remember exactly when in the 80s, maybe late 80s, uh, Clarence Thomas, who was the African American uh, chief, uh, justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, now on the U.S. Supreme Court, has been for a number of years. He was made uh, the head of the EEOC. And he went about reorganizing it. Uh, putting teeth into it, and did a fantastic job turning it into an entity that could really do something for employees and really bring uh, to heel employers who were tre treating their employees poorly and just not uh, looking at it in terms of how they give, give employees of all races and colors an equal opportunity for promotion, pay raises, what have you. And so Clarence Thomas had a lot to do with making the EEOC much more effective. Uh, the EEOC, when they get the complaints, they put them into uh, three categories, A, B, and C, and A's are the ones where they look at them, and those cases raise an issue where the, where the EEOC may decide they want to actually bring a lawsuit. The idea being they're going to pursue a lawsuit that gets, uh, possibly gets appealed up through the courts, up to the U.S. Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court makes law relative to that employment issue. Uh, not a whole lot of cases go there, but that's the avenue they take. They go from there down to B and C, and the C's are the ones they just try to resolve through letters, maybe meetings, that sort of thing, uh, and most of them fall into that category. So that's exactly how uh, the EEOC works. Now, when you look at, uh, look at your textbook, uh, you'll see it moves from uh, telling a little bit about the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission into the intentional and unintentional discrimination. And this I, I do want you to know. I want you to know what this is about. There are actually two major theories about employment discrimination. Uh, and they have to do with two approaches. And they actually come out of the Civil Rights Act of 1991. So the only two you need to think about is the Civil Rights Act of 1964, Title VII. That was the big all-encompassing statute that was passed to try to create employment equality. And in 1991, Congress updated it. So you have the Civil Rights Act of 1991, which is kind of amendments to the 1964 Act. And one of the things they put in place was this how you define discrimination and what's, what's employment discrimination and what's intentional and unintentional. You have two concepts. One is called disparate treatment. The other is called disparate impact. Disparate treatment is intentional discrimination. And so if the EEOC gets a complaint and they look into it and they find that what the employer is doing intentionally, they can surmise from what the facts are, intentionally discriminates against women, uh, Hispanics, blacks, any minority, any group, religion, then that's disparate treatment, discrimination. It's actionable in the courts and the parties are entitled, the, the plaintiff is entitled to a whole host of of, uh, of uh, damages for it. Let me uh, run through them real quickly. Uh, they're entitled to back pay. They're entitled to reimbursement for uh, benefits that they maybe had to pay for insurance benefits. They can obtain damages for future uh, potential losses. Uh, they can get retroactive promotions, rehired and retroactive promotions. And there's even where the, where the intentional discrimination is really uh, reckless that it's, the, it's possible for them to get punitive damages as well. So disparate treatment is intentional discrimination against a protected group, which is generally minorities, uh, by an employer and comes up in under the uh, uh, Civil Rights Act 1991. Now the second part, the second theory is disparate impact. Now, disparate impact is unintentional discrimination. But what it amounts to is where an employer creates some qualification for employment and not intentionally, it, it causes discrimination against a group. Uh, uh, blacks, Hispanics, Asians, whatever it might be. Uh, and the way it works is, 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 let's suppose an employer has a, uh, has a, uh, a promotion exam and it turns out that that uh, 
historically over the past three years, 100 people have taken the exam, 5% of the blacks have passed it, 80% of the whites have passed it. Or it could be uh, anything like that. Uh, it actually could be 80% of the blacks pass it and only 10% of the whites pass it, or the Hispanics. The result is, is if someone brings a case on that basis, that it's disparate impact, if they can show that, then the, the employer doesn't get hammered as bad. He is liable. He is liable for back pay and pr back promotions and reimbursement for expenses and, and those sorts of things. Punitive damages will not come into play because it's not intentional. And then, of course, the, the EEOC and the courts will require him to take corrective action. So there you are. Disparate treatment is intentional. Disparate impact is unintentional. But the result is employment discrimination. In other words, the, the result is a lack of equal opportunity for a minority group of some kind. That's disparity impact. Okay? So, um, let me move back to, uh, I'm going to come back to the Equal Pay Act of 1963. Uh, let me check on my notes here. Uh, what I've done is I've actually combined notes from several uh, courses and lectures I've done, so I haven't got them in exact order. Uh, but I, I, there are important things that both of them I want to make you aware of. Okay, so the, the bottom line is the Equal Employment, uh, Equal Pay Act 1963, it's, it's an attempt to, to have women get as much as possible equal pay for equal work. Now, it doesn't have to be exactly the same work, but when the courts look at it, it if the skills required are significant, are substantially similar, uh, then the court's going to say that, you, that the female workers are entitled to equal pay for that job. Um, so, uh, let me find my note here. Um, Okay, uh, it's, it's enacted through what's known as the Fair Labor Standards Act, the FLSA, uh, and uh, it, it, uh, it deals with uh, disparate treatment, disparate treatment, because in most instances it's in one purpose. The employer is paying less to the, to the employee, the, the female employee, than they're paying to the uh, male employee. Uh, and so the court will uh, step in and, and require the employee, an employer, to again uh, back pay, possibly promotions, that sort of thing, all tied into their pay. Um, the court requires that they be uh, substantially equal, uh, even though the, the job descriptions may be slightly different. So job descriptions may be different. What they look at is the work. What's the work that's being, that the employee is being asked to do? And is it pretty much the same as the male or female? And then the female is entitled to be paid the same. Uh, okay. Um, let me uh, just make a couple of comments out of that. Uh, uh, well, I think I mentioned to you that, that uh, recent studies show, so this goes back to 2009 if you look in the book, uh, that uh, women still uh, only make, on average, about 75% of what men get paid to do. So it's unfortunate, but uh, it is getting slowly but surely better and better. Um, okay. Um, let me uh, move over to my next area here. I, I, I do want to point out also that uh, the EEOC and uh, that both the employer, I mean an employee and the EEOC can bring a lawsuit uh, uh, under dis employment discrimination for disparate treatment or for Im uh, disparate impact. Uh, so either one can bring the action. If the EEOC elects not to, then the employee can. And sometimes those end up in class actions where I think Walmart is an example. Uh, recently they've been in the newspaper in the last year or so. Uh, and they were looking at some big, big numbers for uh, uh, what was alleged by a lot of the female workers, uh, a glass ceiling on promotions and whatnot. Uh, and Walmart, I think, settled that case, but they, they had some real issues and some reasons to be concerned. 
about uh, about that, about whether they had some liability and so forth. Okay. Uh, let me grab one more item out of here for you. Uh, I said I put these together, so I wanted to uh, make sure I cover as much of this as possible. A little bit of this is not in the text, so it's probably worth your while to take a few notes. Um, the EEOC's operations, the five-member board, how they go about uh, deciding whether to take a case to litigation or not, uh, and the employee can do it if the, S if the EEOC chooses not to, that sort of thing. Um, Okay, I'm not going to ask you to be uh, look too closely at religion or gender at all. Let me tell you one thing about religion, though. Uh, in religion, the uh, under Title VII, the employer has a, an obligation, duty, to accommodate as much as possible the employee's religious beliefs, uh, as long as it doesn't create a hardship in running the business. So, from that standpoint, and, and I would like to know this that a person who has a certain religion uh, and they, they celebrate a certain date or whatnot, uh, unless it's a hardship on the business, the employer is asked to accommodate. So it really takes an onerous uh, uh, act by the, uh, by the employer to cause real problems in terms of legal problems and whatnot. But the this, this statute just says accommodate, try to accommodate those person, that person. Uh, and it's pretty clear whether that's an essential person or not, and whether you need him. Uh, and, you, and you don't get, it's not like there's thousands of people with different religious beliefs that are hammering uh, under Title VII for litigation and so forth. So, but, but that is the status of it. Now, interesting thing though, because we're, we're at Cal Baptist here, there is an exception uh, to discriminating in the hiring because of someone's religion. And that is a school with a religious background, with a religious foundation. They discriminate against non-believers of that faith uh, in a hiring practice. So, for example, uh, I do. I also teach at Pepperdine, which is in my office at Pepperdine now. Uh, CBU, Cal Baptist University, is based on the Baptist faith. You can deny employment to anybody applying to go to work at Cal Baptist University, and it's not a violation of Title VII. It's not employment discrimination because the school is founded on those religious beliefs of, of uh, the Baptist. Pepperdine is a Church of Christ. It's their religion, their religion, religious affiliation, and uh, you, they can hire just people from from the Church of Christ if you don't want. There's a school nearby here called Concordia, and I was interested in teaching at it. It's a nice little school here in, in the Irvine area, and I went online and looked at it, and. Uh, they make no bones about it. It says right there on the website, unless you're a member of, and I forget what their faith is. All I know is I wasn't it. And uh, forget about it. Don't even bother saying an application. I mean, it's just, the letters aren't real big, but the meaning is pretty pretty clear. So that's an exception to the religion, uh, uh, religious uh, discrimination in religious hiring. Uh, this doesn't come out accommodating anybody. You just say, I I'm, I'm sorry, Clay, I can't hire you because you you're not in the Church of Christ. And so uh, that is an exception and, and permissible. Um, okay, uh, I want to move now on to uh, sexual harassment. And this is the area where, uh, well, first let me go to online harassment, which, uh, let me see, maybe I skip the page here. Let's see. Uh, yeah, I got a little ahead of myself. On page 497 is where they take up, we take up sexual harassment. Uh, so let me get over and, and get going with that for you. Okay, sexual harassment. Here's, here's the, the background. Again, I always say quickly, but I'm going to have to write for about 34 minutes now. Uh, sexual harassment started becoming an issue in the 70s. And the reason is very logical more and more women began to come into the workplace. So up until the 70s, uh, and nowadays, as we all know, uh, most women of all ages are working in the workplace now to, to help 
that support the family and whatnot. But back prior to probably the mid or early 70s, there weren't a lot of women in the workforce. And, and as more and more women came to the workforce, you had more and more co-workers of both sexes, and you spent a lot of time together. And, um, and, and initially, one of the problems was is you had the good old boy attitude. And women were viewed as you know, a, a novelty, sex object, whatever you want to call it. Uh, they weren't uh, treated. I don't think their the intellect and their capabilities were, were recognized and or you had men who were intimidated by it or, or threatened by it. And so women really uh, took some uh, a beating in the in the 70s, probably, maybe early 80s, um, because the old boy attitude was, you know, you should be home, uh, you know, cooking and cleaning and doing the laundry, and not be out in the workforce. And uh, fortunately, that has been cur that's changed because of just the momentum of women in the workforce, and uh, the laws have come along to protect women and try to make it, uh, they're entitled to work in a workplace where they're not being harassed and, and that sort of thing. Uh, so anyway, let's talk about sexual harassment. Uh, the, uh, the concept is called quid pro quo, which is Latin for something for something. And where it reared its ugly head in the worst form was supervisors or managers uh, asking or direct telling a woman employee that worked for them that if she wanted to get a raise or she wanted to, to get promoted, uh, she better engage in sexual activity with the manager or supervisor if she wasn't going to get anywhere. And uh, very sadly, that was a, a, a fairly common uh, situation in the workplace uh, for a number of years. And uh, finally, in the late 70s, the court began to recognize this and say this is outrageous. Uh, the EEOC really started to come after it. Women became more knowledgeable about their options because stop and think about it when they first went to the, when they went to the workplace, it was easy for them to feel threatened because they, they didn't want to lose their job. And uh, there wasn't a whole lot there to protect them at that point in time. So the, they kind of succumbed or they dodged it the best way they could, made it very uncomfortable and make the, made the workplace horrible. There's nothing worse as to probably some of your experiences working somewhere where you really don't like the culture and you really don't like the environment, but you got to have a job and you got to get paid. And sometimes there's not enough money to have you put up with that. But women had to very often in those days. So, so this idea of quid pro quo came along, and uh, and and the court started saying that's that's employment uh, discrimination, it's sexual harassment, and it made the employer responsible. So. Uh, rather than just one employee being personally responsible, now it made the employer responsible. So the employer was responsible for the environment in which his workers worked. And he had an obligation to see that no sexual harassment took place. Or the, uh, the, the, the twin of that is hostile work environment. Similar kind of thing. I mean, obviously you can have sexual harassment and hostile work environment together at the same time. But you can have hostile work environment where an employee, employee, uh, or supervisor, your supervisor, your manager is just an SOB, and just treats you poorly, and not any sexual innuendo, just makes it impossible for you to work because they're so uh, intolerant or unreasonable, whatever it might be. So you can have hostile work environment, not have sexual harassment. Generally speaking, you have sexual harassment, you have hostile work environment. Uh, the interesting, the first case. Uh, and, and at first, you, you know, you, you brought your action a woman, mostly females, although now you can have sexual harassment the other way. You can have a, a male employee complaining about sexual harassment by a female employee. So uh, in any event, in around 1977-78 was one of the first cases where the court held that the employer was going to be responsible for its supervisors, not just co-workers in sexual harassment but now going to be responsible for the supervisors. And that has been expanded beyond to the point now where an employer can be responsible for sexual harassment by a customer, in other words, a non-employee, if there's a course and pattern of practice by that customer to harass one of your employees. And the classic case, if any of you ever saw the movie with Jack, uh, 
Nicholson and Helen Hunt called As Good As It Gets. Uh, he was kind of a, a, a eccentric novelist writer, and he would come to this restaurant, uh, this coffee shop, breakfast place to have breakfast. And he was really kind of weird. He had to have his napkin just so, and his knife and fork, and Helen Hunt was the waitress. And, then, and that's the story of their relationship. But he would just give her holy hell all the time. He would uh, literally, in effect, harass her uh, with his little idiosyncratic, uh, idiosyncratic uh, eccentric uh, demands and so forth. Well, that is sexual harassment. It was certainly harassment. And uh, her employer could be responsible for not doing anything about it. And eventually in the movie, the, the manager th finally throws it out after a while. But in any event, uh, that movie, Good As It Gets, is a situation where, in other words, you can have a driver. This is why you as managers need to be aware of this. You can have a driver, a delivery person, a salesperson from the outside comes into your company to, to sell items and your secretary or administrative assistant or uh, someone that works in the purchasing department, a female, and this person comes in and starts hitting on them every time they're there and making them uncomfortable, you have to be aware of that because she can bring an action against you for sexual harassment. Uh, and in many cases, uh, even if you don't know about it, you can still be responsible. And that's going to take me into the California law in a second and why uh, California's an important California's demands about guarding against sexual harassment are extensive and you need to know about them. So in any event, so that's sexual harassment. Um, uh, the most, uh, the lion's share of litigation comes out of these areas, wrongful termination, hostile work environment, and sexual harassment. Those are the three areas where employees come after employers. Okay, and so you need to be aware of that. You need to be alert to that. Uh, okay, let's see. Uh, I'm going to flip over here a couple of pages. Uh, oh, and, and, and one other thing too before I go there. If you complain, there are now statutes that deal with retaliation because very often an employer will uh, retaliate against the complaining worker just deciding, well, they're a malcontent or you know, they're a problem, they're you know, squeaky wheel and all this kind of stuff. You better take those complaints seriously and you better investigate them and investigate them right away. Uh, but in any event, uh, employers are now under Title VII courts have held that if they retaliate against an employee, they are up, they're in pro trouble too and they're going to be subject to litigation and uh, an employee may in fact win some, some awards from them and so forth. So retaliation is not permitted uh, and it's it's in Title VII. It goes back to 1964, uh, but it, it had not been made a major issue until in the last probably 15, 20 years that it come along. <coughs> okay. Uh, on page 500, you'll see a major heading: online harassment. It says racial jokes, ethnic slurs, or other comments containing an email, text, or instant message, or blog posts can become the basis for a claim of hostile work environment. Uh, and other forms of discrimination. Uh, and so I, I, my, my brother-in-law worked for a, a Pacific Mutual and they had a young lady who was an excellent employee, uh, was climbing up the, you know, in terms of promotion and whatnot. And for whatever reason, she sent out an email one time to uh, about five or six employees, mostly females as I understand the story. And it was in bad, bad taste and it offended a woman and they had a zero tolerance policy and she was fired and she lost her job uh, because she had a moment of indiscretion, sent out an email that was, uh, and, and who knows, you know, the standard of what's offensive is difficult to know. It's a case by case basis. So some people are offended over something that wouldn't offend you or I that we'd laugh ourselves silly over. Uh, so you just never know and you have to really be careful uh, with that and you have to deal with it quickly uh, with certainty and, and let the employee know what you're doing and, and done with it and let the other employees know. You just can't keep putting it off and saying, oh, don't, don't worry about it. It'll be fine. Uh, you know, sh you shouldn't be upset. She was just joking and whatnot. Uh, you have to be careful because she will go out and find her handy dandy little plaintiff's lawyers who uh, love to file those kinds of lawsuits and uh, they get settled so they make, they make 
make good money doing it. Um, and the company loses money. Okay, let me take you to California. Uh, California uh, had a, a, a they called the California Harassment Prevention Training Law, came out in 2008. And here's what it says. Uh, a company, uh, at, at some point in time, they, there were certain defenses they could have to uh, hostile work environment sexual harassment. And they had various uh, ways that they could defend it. And now, what California said is, you must have a training program in place. You must have policies in place that are published to all the employees that if, if you have a complaint about sexual harassment, hostile work environment, employment discrimination, but primarily sexual harassment is the big one, so, and hostile work environment, because they kind of run hand in hand. You have to be trained and know that, or the employee knows where to go to make the complaints. The supervisor has to be trained as to how to handle them. And the supervisors are required to train so many hours every two years to go to training programs that the law now requires companies to put up. Now, if you do that, you have a presumption in your favor because, again, there is a balance in terms of, you know, you get some employees you're never going to satisfy. You get some employees that have got issues and problems anyway, and they're, you know, they're not worth having, but they're there, and they're going to complain about everything and anything. And so what the, what the law allows you to do is if you're the employer and you have one of these training programs, you keep records about putting everyone through the training, the non-harassment, non-sexual harassment training uh, every two years, and you have a policy and procedure that's in place that's publicized to everybody, this, is, this occurs, you have a complaint, this is how you do it. And the person doesn't do that, doesn't go through that process, then you have a defense, a very strong defense. And even if you... Uh, even if they go to the policy and they continue to say, well, I'm just not satisfied, the policy still gives you sound footing to contest what the employee is complaining about. Now, here's the downside. If you do not have such a program, and if you do not do the training every two years of the supervisor, you may not use that as a defense. So if you don't do the training, but you have some kind of a policy in place that says this is what you do if you want to complain, uh, you can't use that as a defense. So even if you have a program involved in place, you can't use that as a defense because you didn't do the training. You didn't keep the, the supervisory employees up to speed on the latest uh, laws and so forth on, on sexual harassment, hostile work environment. Okay. Uh, and the fact that you didn't know that a supervisor either didn't report up or was involved in a matter of hostile work environment is no defense. If you don't have that program in place, you're pretty much a sitting duck. Uh, it's a huge expansion by the courts. Okay? Uh, all right, let's run to uh, discrimination based on age. Uh, let me find my note on that real quickly, and we will go there. Um, Age discrimination here. Here we go. Okay, age discrimination. This was the uh, the ADEA we call it ADEA. I like I like you to know that an acronym ADEA, which is the, uh, the age discrimination age age discrimination in Employment Act 67. It says that anybody who's over the age of 40 who is let go, if they can show this, I'm going to give you the items then there's a prima facie case that the employer is discriminated against them. Number one, that they're over 40 years of age. Easy, right? The birth certificate. Number two, you're a member of the protected class. Well, the protected class is anyone over 40. So you can put those, kind of roll those together. But you've got to be over 40. You've got to be able to prove that. That makes you a member of the protected class. You have to show that you are qualified for the position. So let's take in a hiring situation. If you can show that you're qualified in that for that position, then you've satisfied the next to last requirement. And then that you can show, based on your termination, that under the circumstances it gives rise to an inference of discrimination. Now, classically what happens is when companies get into trouble financially, when sales have gone down, one thing or another, very often to cut costs, they will eliminate 
the older workers because they've been there longer, their salaries are usually higher, they make more money, and so it's better to get rid of them and bring in young people who uh, don't require as much salary or income, and you save money that way. This, this statute, the ADEA, the Age Discrimination and Employment Act, is for that purpose, to protect people over 40. And I can tell you from my own business career that 40 is a good number because uh, an employee, an, an applicant for a job or an employee working in the company, uh, there's something about the attitude of owners and employers towards someone who's older. They just tend to like people 20, 21 to 38, 39. They just, there's a perception they have more energy, which can be totally untrue, and many times is, and in today's world, you know, what's the saying? The, uh, uh, the 50 is the new 40, the 60 is the new 50. Uh, I won't tell you how old I am, but I'm a lot closer to 70 than I am to 50. Uh, so people uh, have this perception, which is not fair. And so many people will lose their job, uh, you know, get laid off, uh, and they're the older worker. So again, as a manager, you have to be very careful how you do this. Uh, another thing, too, is uh, the younger worker, I mean, the, the, the person over 40 being laid off, it, he doesn't have to be replaced by a younger worker. He can be replaced by an older worker. Maybe the older worker will take the job for less money. Uh, whatever the reason is, it doesn't matter the age of the worker. It's a stronger presumption if it's a younger worker, but it could be an older worker. Uh, and so you still have to show that prima facie case. And the big one is you have to be able to show circumstances that raise an inference that you were discriminated against because you were over 40, okay? Um, there's a, a, a statute, it's not in the book, uh, the Older Worker Benefits Protection Act was 1990, and it requires an employer to not discriminate against an employee be, uh, for, for benefits, health benefits. So you can't have a, a plan for uh, everybody under 40 or under 50 or even 60 and then have a different kind of plan for those people, you know, charging them more money or reducing their benefits, that sort of thing. Uh, you have to offer them the same thing you're offering the younger workers. So uh, that's an interesting statute and very important in light of the fact of what's going on. Sorry for diving out of the picture there. Uh, it's very important for what's going on in today's world with medical costs, medical expenses, and so forth. So uh, that's your Age Discrimination Act. Uh, not necessary for you to go through all the procedures under the ADEA. Just know what it is. Know what the what the requirements are. You're over 40. Remember the protected class, which kind of goes together. That you're qualified for the job, and that there's a strong inference that you were discriminated against in being laid off or what have you, or not being hired. Okay. All right. The next one is uh, discrimination based on disability. This is another one for you to be uh, aware of. Uh, Find my notes on this one. Oh, there is discrimination because of disability. Okay, here we go. It's down at the bottom of the page, so I didn't see it. Okay. Uh, there's a, a statute called the uh, Rehabilitation Act, 1973, deals with discrimination against disabled workers. And the whole idea is to give them an equal opportunity to compete for a job and so forth. Uh, and here's the way this works. Uh, it extends protection to disabled workers. Uh, actually, it extended it into the, go into the government area as well. So now it made all the state, local, federal governments also equally responsible to provide working uh, for uh, the disabled. Uh, this is not exactly what I want, so let me see if I can find it here. And the uh, disabled people here. And, uh, why can't I find it? I pretty much know it by heart anyway, but I, I was going to look for it. Uh, <coughs> three. 
Okay, well, here we go. First of all, uh, you uh, you have to determine what's a disability, and uh, they actually list them here, if I'm not mistaken. Health conditions that have been considered disabilities are blindness, alcoholism, heart disease, cancer, muscular dis dystrophy, cerebral palsy, diabetes, AIDS, and morbid obesity. So all of those are viewed as uh, disabilities. And therefore, the employer has to do the following. The employer has to provide a reasonable accommodation for the disabled worker. Um, you're familiar now, I'm sure, with a lot of businesses. In fact, when my law partners back east remodeled our, our building back there, I've been here in California for a few years, and, and uh, the firm expanded. Uh, they were required to put a ramp in for a wheelchair. We had an older building uh, built back in the early 1900s that uh, we turned into a law office in a nice residential area. And of course, it didn't have any of those kinds of things that now is in every building. And uh, so we were required to put a ramp in for both our clients and for if we had a d disabled worker. So the accommodation, though, it has to be a reasonable accommodation. So let's suppose you have a worker, uh, someone wants a job, and the job is on the third floor of your, of your building. And uh, you're not required uh, to put an elevator in. Uh, you are maybe in the bigger building and so forth, but in our case, we had a little three, we had a three story colonial, uh, Georgia colonial house that was turned to a law office. And uh, they're not going to require us, because of the economic hardship, to spend fifteen or twenty thousand dollars to put an elevator in so that a disabled worker can get to the third floor. So it has to be a reasonable accommodation. Uh, I had a, a, a fellow working for me who had a bad back, uh, and, and he was working his way towards this. Is being disabled now. I saw this coming uh, because I could. I just sensed that he had the, the uh, propensity to possibly be a, a problem, and so I went out and, and spent a few hundred extra dollars for a chair. He said he needed this chair for his back and one thing or another. That's a reasonable accommodation. A little side note: when I told him that this confirmed my sense of him in a way. When I told him, "Okay, go out and, and uh, bring me back a." Uh, you know, some quotes on chairs and bring back some pictures. And of course, what do you think he came back with? He came back with a $1,200 chair. Um, you know, I mean, the only thing he didn't have was an engine that he could drive it somewhere. And I said to him, you know, that's not going to work. Uh, you know, about two to three hundred dollars is what I'm thinking about in my budget, but uh, we're not going to spend eleven hundred dollars to turn around for a chair for you. And how do you know he's not going to quit uh, within a month or a year? And who's going to want the chair? And you know, that sort of thing. Is, is he going to be satisfied? So, but that's a reasonable accommodation. Uh, okay, so that's uh, pretty much what I want to tell you about uh, that. Reasonable accommodations are addressed on page 505 of your textbook. Uh, and it talks here on 506 about undue hardship. Uh, uh, undue hardship. Here, here's here's an, an interesting example of one where it says that Brian Lockhart, who used a wheelchair, uh, works for a cell phone company. Lark, Lark, Lock, Lockhart informs the company's supervisor that the parking spaces are so narrow he's unable to extend the ramp on his van that allows him to get out and use his wheelchair. And you've probably seen vans where people who are disabled and, and the side door slides open and there's a, a little ramp that comes out. He puts his wheelchair on the ramp and it takes him out and sets him down a little lift. And he's saying the parking spaces are too narrow. Uh, and so he proposes to the employer that they rent him a parking space across the street in the larger parking area uh, so that he's got room to, for the ramp to come down. It says, in this instance, the court would likely find that it would not be an undue hardship for the employer to pay for additional parking for a Lockhart. Now, you know. If I were the employer, I'd probably just find two spaces, white out, you know, get rid of the white, black out the white line of two of them and turn one into one and reserve it for him. But depending on what it costs to park him across the street, you know, I think I'd be accommodating him well that way. But you'll see the example is, that's the example of what's a reasonable accommodation. Uh, if there's no other parking place around, no other lot across the way, 
then maybe you have to do what I suggested. But you have to try to accommodate him. Uh, you know, you don't you don't have to spend a hundred bucks a month for him to park necessarily. But you know, if it's twenty or thirty bucks, the court may say you need to accommodate him. Okay. Um, defenses to employment discrimination. There's three. There's three. The first one is business necessity, where the job is such that it requires that somebody uh, have those kinds of skill sets that this person doesn't have. Uh, so businesses, he defends against the claim if the employer can demonstrate uh, a connection exists between having a high school education and job performance, the employer normally will succeed in calling this a business necessity. So if he is able to say that I need someone with this level of education to perform this task, then he can discriminate against the uh, other person. Uh, possibly even a disabled person uh, because without a, without a high school education because he's been able to demonstrate that this job requires that level of education. So that's a business necessity. The other one's called a bona fide uh, a bona fide occupational qualification, uh, and it has to do with uh, how you uh, what the jobs required. So I think the book gives you the classic example that's been given for years is. Uh, a male comes in and wants a job uh, in a ladies' shop uh, it, where the salespeople are required to go back into the dressing room and help the female customers with the clothes and bring them back and forth and interact with them. And the employer says, no, you're uh, not going to hire you. We don't want men back there. That's a, what we call a BFOQ, bona fide occupational qualification. And it, and it makes sense uh, to me. So. Anyway, uh, you run into, to me, strange people challenging that all the time. Somebody's got a reason to say it's, it's uh, a violation of Title VII or whatever. And the last one, so you've got business necessity, you've got BFOQ, bona fide occupational qualification, and you've got uh, seniority systems. So where there are seniority systems in place, uh, absent any intent for discrimination, uh, layoffs following a seniority system are not discrimination, which is kind of the old la uh, fir last in, first out. So we have to see it a lot in the teaching profession, sadly, because my wife, who's just retired from teaching, has told me more than once that if they decide they've got to cut staff and they cut three or four people, then invariably they'll get one or two of these young folks that come in that are just on fire with energy and desire and skill and aptitude and somebody who's been there 35 years who uh, they come in and they stand around and they teach but the fire is gone and so forth and you got to let the young person go. Uh, in fact when my wife first started the first two or three years because you have to give notice and I think you have to give it a couple of months in advance and you get like a little it's not you know you've heard of the pink slip well, this is the pink sheet which is notice. And so for three years, she got one every year, two months before school was out, so that the school could cover themselves. And if they had to do some layoffs in various departments or whatnot, then, then here you were. She was new, and so she was going to be one of the persons at the door. So seniority systems are acceptable. You can discriminate on that basis. Okay. Um, and uh, affirmative action. We'll, we'll hit affirmative action. Uh, gosh, I'm going on an hour. I'll, I'll get through the other two in 20, 30 minutes, and we'll be, we'll be good to go. Uh, okay, affirmative action. Let's talk about that. Here's how affirmative action came about. And it also grew up during the Civil Rights Movement. It was apparent, I think, in the country, probably to everybody, because there had been very little progress from uh, 1886 to 1964. Uh, in terms of blacks getting equal opportunities. There was residential discrimination. There was school segregation still going on. Um, and so African Americans, it was focused on African Americans at the time, had since expanded to other minority groups. And the idea was they had been held down for so long. Uh, they had been discriminated against for so long in the work area. Uh, in schooling that we need to have affirmative action to push them forward 
and push them forward fast and be certain, not not one or two people that have got exceptional talent, because many times those minorities would get ahead just by the strength of their own talent and drive, but you have a lot of other people who are kind of average to a little above average that are minorities and they're not getting a chance. And so affirmative action came along and it was based on a quota system. And the quota system basically was, and I forget how the different formulas would work, but it might be that they would say, you know, in this job, and in this profession, uh, or this company, and a lot of times what they do is if you were federally funded or you got federal funds from the government, and the government said, we, we will withhold the funds if you don't comply with our rules and regulations. And they'd say, we want 10% uh, blacks and 5% Hispanic and 3% Asian, whatever it might be. I don't know how they would come up with these proportions. The idea was we're going to get, on a, out of a class of 100 students going to law school, we're going to get 20 of them are going to be African American students. And so you could get, and, and you often did, you'd get white students who had, let's say, a 3.6, and you have a black student who had a 3.1 or 3.2 grade point average in high school, and they would get into law school, and the 3.6 would not, because there wasn't enough space, they only had 100 seats, and their 20 of them are going to the minority, they're going to the African American. And so that was what affirmative action was about. Now, Here's what happened, and, and it reflects a cultural view. It reflects a view of, of people in the country uh, because, uh, and, and it got, affirmative action got really crazy in some respects. I met a young girl across the street, and she wanted to go to UCLA. It was hard, really hard to get in. They had a quota system back then, uh, and this was in the, gosh, I guess the late 70s, maybe early 80s late 70s. Excuse me. Need more caffeine? Uh, sorry. Uh, she uh, applied and she was able to show through her family lineage that she was something, you know, one twentieth Indian, Native American, somewhere in the family, trace it back to wherever. And she got a spot at UCLA because of the quota system. When lots of other students who were capable or had better grades than she did or whatever, maybe more deserving for whatever reason, couldn't get in. She got in. And so it got a little nutty because people were finding out all. In fact, this, this uh, gal, Elizabeth Warren, who just uh, became a senator in, in Massachusetts, uh, she, she got into Harvard, I think, and she got into, I think, Harvard Law School. I think she got into maybe Harvard, one of the Ivy League schools claiming that she was 132nd Cherokee Indian. And the media picked it up and went and did some investigation. And it was basically a ruse. And it was basically a ruse. Uh, but the media, they uncovered it. Uh, you know, we get, we, get, we get our polarized media in here. And so uh, no one's surprised. Fox News tends to be on the conservative side. And most of the other major ones tend to be on the liberal side. But it did get into all the newspapers. But Fox News, or this conservative size, went a little deeper into it. And it was clear from the research that it was a, it was a ruse. Uh, and yet she got into, uh, got into these schools and therefore got these big, good credentials and so forth. Uh, Obama was going to put her in charge of the con Consumer Protection Division. She's an extremely liberal woman, I'm sure very smart. But she basically took advantage of affirmative action. And the reality was, there was no documentation to show. She just wrote it down on the school application. Nobody checked. Nobody looked. And part of the joke was is when they asked her what, how she knew she was a part Cherokee Indian, she said, well, I have high cheekbones. So there you have it. Well, what, what happened in, uh, in the late 70s was is people began to feel like uh, the quota system was unfair. And you got this idea of reverse discrimination. And there was a, a young fellow applying to uh, Mich University of Michigan Medical School. Most of this reverse discrimination started coming out of the university admissions. That's where it focused before they started looking at jobs. And uh, this fellow's name was Baki, B-A-K-K-E. And he filed a lawsuit claiming reverse discrimination. And he claimed that under the equal protection laws of the Constitution uh, uh, and under uh, 14th Amendment, uh, 
equal protection of the laws and so forth and due process, that he'd been discriminated against. Because the law basically says you can't discriminate anybody because of race color. Well, guess what? White's a color. I mean, the last time I checked, white's a color, right? So the court bought that and issued an opinion. And affirmative action has been narrowed ever since. And basically, they first said, no quotas at all. You can't have quotas, period. And schools then, there's always ways around it. Schools began to work, try to work around it or not, because they were kind of committed. And they wanted to continue. But the, the consensus was that, that the, the head start, the push start, that took place from, say, 64 to 78, which was, what, uh, 16 years or so, 18 years, whatever, um, 16 years, was that was enough to raise the, the, the bar, or not raise the bar, but raise the level of, of competitiveness by minorities. That minorities now had gotten into a lot of the universities and schools, gotten good grades, when now they were going up into law school and so forth. But that they had to compete now on a more level playing field with the whites. And so they, they came out, the Supreme Court came out and said, we're not going to accept quota systems. You can't just have a flat quota. Because that is discrimination. It's reverse discrimination against uh, qualifying whites. What they said was, is you can use race, you can use the minority as a factor, one factor among the others, which is grade point average, so let's say, activities in school, uh, th all those sorts of things. So the court did say that, and they and began to narrow affirmative action. And ever since then, affirmative action uh, has been uh, reduced to a certain extent by the courts. Let me see if I can find my other notes on this to see if there's anything else I want to mention to you about affirmative action. Uh, the Bakke case was 1978, uh, and that's when the court began abandoning uh, abandoning affirmative action. Um, and so uh, that's basically it. Uh, they were just, the, the court, a lot of times the Supreme Court will attempt to sense the mood of the country. The, they'll look at the law, but a lot of law is, is a reflection of how people feel about what's going on in the, in the country. And they're, you know, California passed a statute, or passed a proposition I think in the last, I think it was Prop 108 or 104, where it also had a prop, it, the proposition said that you can't discriminate on a quota basis and did away with uh, affirmative action. And that's the state of the law in California now, of all states, California being a pretty liberal state. Okay? All right, here we go. Let's get moving here. Consumer protection. Okay? Uh, let me flip over to the right uh, chapter here. And uh, we'll do consumer protection, which is chapter 24. Uh, and uh, just a couple things to know about it. First of all, uh, almost all consumer protection emanates from the Federal Trade Act and the Federal Trade Commission. Okay, so the Federal Trade Act uh, was passed in 1914. So the Federal Trade Commission Act was, was uh, 1914. And its primary focus was to go against, go after deceptive advertising. And so, uh, when someone made a a half truth claim, or they they made a claim about something saying that the, you know factually this is uh, you can take this to the bank, this is what the product can do, or this is what the service will be, and it turns out they're just making it look like it's a fact, it's not a fact. That's going to be a violation of the regulations of the Federal Trade Commission and you're subject to penalties of some significance. On the other hand, if you make vague claims, vague generalities about what your product it's the best vacuum cleaner you can ever buy. Uh, or you say you exaggerate, it's got more features than any other vacuum cleaner on the market. Uh, the court looks at that and says that's what they call puffery. In other words, you just kind of, you know, generally speaking, this is the greatest versus this vacuum cleaner has, uh, you know, a bag that's twice the size as any other bag. This this vacuum cleaner will uh, suck up more dirt than, than every other vacuum cleaner in the country. This vacuum never breaks down. This vacuum has uh, 30 feet of extension cord, and the others only have six, or whatever. And it's clear that these are exaggerations that are 
trying to be based on fact that are not true, uh, then you're going to be in violation of the Federal Trade Requirements, Federal Trade Commission uh, regulations. Here's an example here of your Campbell's Soup, uh, the Campbell's Soup case where they talk about how their soup lowers cholesterol and therefore lowers the risk of heart attack and then it turns out that when you look at Campbell's soups there's lots of others that have high in sodium and therefore they can increase the, the prospects of, of uh, uh, heart disease. And so what, what the, uh, the Federal Trade Commission can do is it, it number one it can file a formal complaint against the, the uh, manufacturer or the seller of the product and issue a cease and desist order and tell them you must stop advertising, you must start making those claims. <clears throat> Beyond that, it can also force them to uh, do what they call counter advertising, which is put advertisements out there saying, this is not accurate, and uh, this is accurate, but this other claims we made are not accurate, or we're pulling them back, or any way they want to do it, so it's clear that the people know that it's not an accurate claim anymore. Uh, then the court can, the, uh, the FTC can require them to do that. And they also may seek restitution. They may make a uh, a seller of goods refund money to people who paid money uh, for something that was deceptively advertised and either wasn't delivered or didn't do half of what they said it would do or was just a cheap knockoff of some other product that people thought they were getting. Okay, uh, another one's the bait and switch. You all are familiar with that. You know, it used to be auto dealers would put you know one car on the on the lot for ten thousand dollars and. There was one of them, and it was stripped to the, to the bones, and they get you in there for the $10,000 car, and the next thing they've got you down the end of the lot buying a $25,000 car. And that's the bait and switch. Or, or they'd have an advertisement saying they've got the 10000 car down there, and they don't have it at all. Uh, in the height of the bait and switch days in the 70s, uh, they did it that way. Whatever they could take to get you in, and then they just start squeezing you. They used to call them mouse houses because the idea was the cat's down there waiting. You get the mouse in there and you just chase them all around the lot until you pin them down, get your claws in, put them in that $25,000 car you can't, can't afford and get them out of there, get your money. So that's the bait and switch. So you, basically it says if you, if you advertise, in fact you'll see in your, in your newspaper sometimes, you'll see they'll, they'll advertise a car, they'll advertise a price and they'll say three at this price or two at this price. So the idea is that they're not, they've got some inventory, they're not just got one single car. They've got some other cars that fall into the same category of specials. Okay, so like I said, they can file a, uh, a claim, a complaint, a formal complaint against you. Now, let's go to, to telemarketing and fax advertising uh, under that statute. And, let's, and again, just know what this talks about. Uh, Telemarketing. Okay, you've got the uh, tele uh, Telephone Consumer Protection Act, uh, which looks like it was done in. Uh, it's not that old. It's fairly recent, uh, and I think in the 2000s. But anyway, uh, you are not allowed to use auto dialers, so you can't uh, you can't use an auto dialer where the phone just rings one number after another, after another, another. You can't do that. Nor can you do the auto fax. Now the auto fax was done, I think, maybe these laws are 20 years old by now. And time flies when you're my age. But um, I can remember we would get auto faxes at work. And But what they put on is if you don't want to receive this fax again, just call this number. And that would knock you off. The, they had to take you off. So uh, rather than ask for permission, uh, before they'd send it to you, they would just send the fax and tell you if you don't want it, just send, call this number and say don't send me the fax and they take you off. So those were two. So so basically the, the, this statute, the tele, telemarketing statute, also said you can, you know, there's a no, do not call registry. That sometimes I wonder if that really works because we still get solicitation calls, not like we used to. Uh, you can have the person's name removed from a list. So I've sent emails before to people saying, uh, you know, take me off your mailing list. I don't want any more stuff from you. And also, as you know, on your computer, you can put a, you know, you can put the filter in there and you type in the the, the name and and, uh, and record it, put in your prohibited, and it goes right into junk mail. So there are ways to stop that down. It used to be one of the most intrusive experiences you'd ever want to have. I mean, we. 20 years ago, we would get five, six, seven calls a night, and uh, and so I just stopped answering them. But in any event, uh, okay, labeling and packaging. Uh, 
Uh, labeling and packaging tends to be uh, monitored by the uh, Food and Drug Administration, uh, the EPA. There's a number of agencies, the Agri Department of Agriculture, they're all involved in the labeling and packaging laws. Uh, and uh, you'll see that it talks about a number of statutes here, and you don't need to know these statutes, uh, 1939, 1951, 52. They've been, they've been dealing with this for years. Um, and so uh, here's the idea with the labeling and packaging. And that is the, the labeling must be two things. It needs to be easily understood, very easily understood, and it must be in a conspicuous place where people can see it. And of course one of the more, more famous ones is the warnings on the cigarette packages. Now I can tell you, because I was a young guy when this cigarette thing started, the tobacco companies bought that tooth and nail. I mean, they spent millions on lobbying. What not. They didn't even want the, I mean, you think about it in today's world where you, you, know, you almost can't smoke anywhere in the world, certainly in the U.S. Uh, they fought that tooth and nail. They didn't want that warning in it on the side of the pack that says the Surgeon General has determined that uh, smoking cigarettes can be harmful to your I think it just said harmful to your health. I think eventually they, they got it to say it could uh, be a cause of cancer once it was connected. But, and now you look at the labeling and, you know, it's extensive about the risks of cigarette smoking. Uh, but the tobacco industry probably kept that off a pack of cigarettes for 10 years. And they must have spent millions. I mean, they had people sleeping outside the door of uh, offices of these congressmen and whatnot. Uh, and uh, they, they finally, uh, the uh, FDA got the, got the go-ahead to put the Surgeon General to put the warning packages on cigarettes. Uh, also labeling on uh, food, and the FDA enforces that. So you've got to have labeling about the, the, the quantities and the, uh, the calories and, and uh, how many servings and who's the distributor of it and all that sort of stuff. So you kind of know where the food comes from. The EPA, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency push, 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 so that now you have to have a label on the car. When you look at the car, the sticker on the window, the back window of the car, it tells you what the gas mileage is supposed to be. And that's supposed to not be deceptive. It's supposed to be, uh, and you know, quite frankly, uh, sometimes I wonder about that because I know that uh, some of our more recent cars, they tell you it's going to get 23 miles to the gallon and it gets 19 or 18, but you know, not everybody wants to pour it or whatnot over it. So. But that's the labeling that's required, packaging and labeling. Okay, sales. Sales, that's section three in the book. And basically the whole idea is disclosure of terms of a sale. And it deals with a lot of uh, unsolicited merchandise. You just get merchandise sent to you. And by the way, if you get unsolicited merchandise sent to you, you can keep it now. Under a statute here, you can just keep it. So the, the, the seller takes their own risk. They want to send you something. Uh, they can, it used to be they'd send it to you. If you didn't return it in 30 days, they'd send you a bill. And uh, for a long time, back in the 70s, I guess, you know, sellers would enforce that. You know, well, I sent you the goods. You didn't send them back. You know, and, and here's where it happens today, which is a bunch of baloney. And again, the courts haven't dealt with this, and I'm not sure they would knock it out. But how many of you have been involved in situations where, uh, like Sirius Radio, as an example. Uh, I bought a new car recently. It had Sirius Radio in it. You sign up for Sirius Radio, you get 90 days free, or you, you, you get 90 days to start with. Uh, and then if you sign up, uh, they'll, you'll call them and they'll say, well, we'll give you another 90-day period to try it. If you don't like it, you can cancel. Well, that's the key. You can cancel. But what happens is, is people buy things like that. They buy books, records, all kinds of stuff online over the phone from the television offers. And generally speaking, if you don't, you don't affirmatively take an action to cancel, they just keep sending you bills. And the contract says that you've got to cancel. And if you don't cancel, then they keep billing it and you own the money. <coughs> now I wonder about that. That's, you know, but that's business. There's always a way to pervert the good intentions of the statute to not be able to force something on you and have you paying money out. And these people that do this kind of stuff well recognize that, uh, uh, you know, there's going to be a number of people that are just going to leave it on their bill because they don't pay it, watch it close enough. And they might stay in their bill for six months or a year, and they collected 30 bucks a month out of you for 
six, seven, eight, nine months times 300,000 people, that's a lot of money. So uh, the courts really haven't gone after that like I think they should. I, I, I don't necessarily think you should be able to uh, put these open-ended offers out there that then you're the one who has to cancel. Anyway, that's the way it goes. Okay, uh, the disclosures deal with, it also has to do with online sales, telephone sales. I'll talk in more detail about Regulation Z. You know what Regulation Z is? It deals with credit transactions. Regulation Z deals with credit transactions. I want you to know what that's about. You need to know for your own personal uh, benefit with respect to buying a house or buying anything on sale, on, on terms, credit terms, installment terms. Uh, okay, now it talks about, uh, there's, and I think Reg Z requires this because I, I spent a fair amount of time out of the mortgage and finance business, insurance and finance business. But anyway, you have a three day right of rescission. So in most installment sale settings, you have a three day right to rescind. So you buy something, installment sale, sign the paperwork. Within three days, you can go to them and say, you know what, I want out of this deal. And they must refund your money. Uh, now, under the idea of telephone and mail order sales, and let's see if that's a new section in the book here, it might be. Uh, yeah, on page uh, 545, there's a telephone and mail order sales. This does some, some good things for the consumer, protects the consumer. That is, uh, if you buy something online or by telephone, they have to, re to ship it within a certain number of days. So it depends on what the, who the state is. A lot of times the states have similar laws and they have to ship within the same certain number of days. Uh, and they also have to give you a refund within certain days if you send it. And they can't just hold your refund. Because a lot of companies will do that and then just figure you'll forget it. So they've got obligations to send your refund back within this period of time. Now, Reg Z, Truth in Lending, under Section 4, Credit Protection, Truth in Lending Act. It's a disclosure law, and basically when you get a loan under Reg Z, it has to tell you, and these are the big ones, what's the interest rate, what's the annual percentage rate, because they're different. The annual percentage rate tends to be higher and by a fraction of a point. So your interest rate might be 4.25, and your real interest rate, your APR, annual percentage rate, might be uh, 4. 3-1. So instead of four and a quarter, it's 4.3 or 4.31 or 4.33, so four and a third instead of four and a quarter. Well, you think, well, is that that important? Darn right it is. The Bank of America does 300,000 loans and think, guess you thinking you're paying four and a quarter and you're paying 4.33. They're making big, big money off of those 300,000 loans. And so you have to be noticed to that. And why do you get noticed? Because so then you can comparison shop. You can go to another lender and say, okay, they're going to give me 4.25, and the APR is 4.33. And the other bank may say, well, we're going to, we're going to lower your rate to 4.175, and that'll get you down with the APR will be 4.25, and therefore you're going to, we can beat them. Uh, we can give you a better deal. So you've got your interest rate, your APR, and then here's the, the add-ons that lenders get you for. They've got finance charges, they have costs, various costs they put on there, you know, title search, escrow fee, uh, all those sorts of things. Uh, uh, appraisal, uh, they'll have all kinds of little fees they add on. And so those have to be broken out in your Reg Z form. The Reg Z form tells you what all those expenses are, so you know every single penny that's going out. Uh, and Reg Z is particularly focused on these three areas, automobiles, installment sales, installment credit sales where you're making monthly payments. So it would be things like automobiles, home appliances, home improvements, maybe you have a pool put in the backyard and you financed it. So you've got to be told on a Reg Z statement, what's the interest rate, what's the APR, what are the finance charges, both monthly and for the entire transaction? It's up there in a box at the top of the document. Uh, and then what are the additional add-ons, costs and fees that you're being charged for? So that's now required. There used to be large-scale abuses on this, uh, and particularly in the home improvement area. Uh, there used to be home improvement companies would come and uh, uh, they would sell people a, uh, an air conditioner or some such thing. 
and get an installment sales contract, and then the people would default and they'd take the house. This was back in the 70s. It was really nasty. I mean, uh, the government had to step in because what they do is they flood. Uh, we, we knew of a company from uh, Train Air Conditioning from Minnesota. They had an operation down in Anaheim here. And they would literally send their uh, army of salespeople out to the lower socioeconomic areas of Los Angeles and Anaheim and Santa Ana, sell these people air conditioners that were sometimes as big as the house. Uh, the loan would be, and, and then they'd finance them through a bank, they'd have a bank that would finance them for them. They'd finance it for, you know, five years at uh, $31,000 or some egregious sum. People couldn't make the payments after a year, a year and a half, or nine months. And they had a lien contract which allowed them to go out and lien the house and then sell the house. And uh, there were, their pool dealers were doing that because uh, they were helping the lenders get the loans. So Reg Z has gone a long way in stopping that, preventing that. Okay, environmental law. I'm going to hit this one quick, and we're going to wrap it up. Uh, chapter 25, a couple things to know. The environmentalist really, is, the environmental movement took root, I would say, uh, although maybe some of the texts here is going to tell me wrong, but my recollection is it really got started in the 70s, I guess you'd say, early 70s. I mean, we've always been, con uh, you know, uh, what's the word, Conser conservatory, we've always, conservation, we've always been interested in conservation. Environment, environmental, uh, the environmental movement is much more uh, detailed, specific, targeted at things that it believes are a danger to our living as organisms on the planet, if you will. And so uh, while we had conservation going back to Teddy Roosevelt's days in the early 1900s, Environmental law, in my way of thinking, really got going into the 70s, mid 70s, and so forth. And environmentalists spent a lot of time, probably as much time as the tobacco industry in Congress, uh, at the front doors of Congress, demanding different things cut, get put in place. But before that happened, and a lot of these regulations took place in the, well, CIM already shown as being wrong. The EPA was 1970, the Environmental Protection Agency. They, they led this charge. But prior to that, you still had common law. If you remember, we have English common law, which is our law is based on English common law, uh, which is a series of court decisions, you may recall. And now we are, we are more and more a statutory system of laws in this country. We write the laws now. We don't have time for the cases to go to the courts and show a different trend. But in any event, at one point, there was the common law to deal with environmental issues, and, and the, the bases were uh, something was a nuisance, or there was negligence involved, or strict liability. So you could have situations where that, the, you know, the dynamiting is going to have an impact on the environment, right, with the dust and the smoke and one thing, uh, and it's strict, there's strict liability there because it's such an ultra-hazardous activity. So aside from tort law, which I think we looked at, uh, Environmental law says that uh, early on, before the Environmental Protection Agency, lawsuits were brought by agencies using strict liability, using negligence, and using nuisance. That the the, the uh, toxins that are being released from this factory are a nuisance. That's how it started. Now along comes the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, a very controversial agency. Uh, the federal uh, this federal law then what generally happens is the states just go right behind them with a very similar statute and begin to put their their state statutes into place and enforce uh, EPA rules and regulations and write rules and regulations very similar to what the EPA did. Uh, and one of the big things that this came up with came up with was what they call an environmental impact study. Now the controversy over this is business versus environmentalists. Businesses Anytime the, environment, the EPA puts out regulations to do things to protect the environment, which all of us are in favor of, there's a cost. There's a cost. And who's going to pay that cost? And they're expecting business to pay the cost. Okay? And so you think, well, that's good. You know, business has got money. They're going to pay. Guess what? They're going to pass that cost on to us. They're not going to just eat that cost. That's not the way business works. Business wants to make a profit. And if you start sucking the profit out of them, they're going to figure out a way to get it back. And the way they get it back is raise the prices. 
So EPA creates a cost. The other thing too, EPA with their environmental impact studies create a delay in business moving forward with things. Uh, the one that most of us think about is development, building more neighborhoods, uh, houses, uh, shopping centers, uh, strip malls, big buildings, what have you. Uh, the environmental impact studies can, can go a long way towards putting that project off another year, year and a half while the environmental impact study is done. It's also become an industry that uh, people, companies that do the environmental impact studies uh, make a ton of money doing them. Okay, so here they are. Here's the big ones. The Clean Air Act of 1963. The Clean Air Act. Okay. One of the places it took on initially was the automobile, where it, it produced emission standards and said you needed, that the automobile industry needed to lower its emission standards in cars. That's where you got the catalytic, catalytic converter. California has one of the toughest anti-smog laws in, this, in the country. And catalytic converters, I think, first came out here. I don't know if they use them in other states yet, but California required them. Well, guess what? Now you've got the part. You've got to assemble it. So catalytic converters might cost two or $300 if you buy them. So the, the manufacturer, maybe he paid 75 for it. And the, but maybe it took an X number more minutes to put that in the car. So now that's your labor cost. So let's say it's 25 So now it's an extra 100 bucks to put the catalytic converter in the car that's being shipped to California. That by California statute, because maybe California statute, and most of them are, are stricter than the federal statute. So the Clean Air Act was d driven toward that, and I, and I always remember we talking about uh, auto emissions and so forth. When I first got in the finance and insurance business, we had a lot of auto dealers as, as clients for our insurance. And I remember, so I would follow the auto industry and whatnot, and this was back in the 80s, and it said that they were selling 16 million cars a year. Now, there's only 310 million of us here in the country. And that was 30 years ago, right? Roughly, or 25 years ago. Now, I think automobile sales maybe have, have uh, slowed a little bit, but I think they run somewhere between 10 uh, and maybe 12 or 13 million cars a year. Now, take that over 20 years, that's a lot of cars, as, as we all know. In fact, just for the fun of it, next time you drive down your street on your way home, Count the number of cars in the, in the last three blocks before you get home. Count the number of cars that are parked along the, the curb, because nobody has room in their garages anymore. And count the number of cars there. I counted the other night. This, this won't be the test or in the quiz. Uh, and there were 72 cars parked. When I came in the back of my neighborhood, I had to go about six blocks. There were 72 cars parked along the street coming around to my, my house in Irvine. And uh, you know, it's just... There are cars everywhere when you're looking on the freeway, right? Uh, but anyway, so but you can see the air pollution aspect of that. And so that's where the Clean Air Act came in, and certainly a statute worth worthwhile as far as I'm concerned. Clean Air Act also banned various substances. The ones that the big ones to keep in mind are things like asbestos, things like house paint, anything that gives off toxic fumes of some kind, uh, and it provides for heavy fines, twenty-five thousand dollars a day, for not correcting it. And out here in California, we had the AQMD, the Air Quality uh, Management District. They're, they have districts all around uh, Southern California, probably throughout the state. So air, the, the Clean Air Act, 1963, started with automobile emissions, deals with asbestos, so it deals with uh, substances that, that emit toxic fumes. Asbestos, that, by the way, grew into a huge industry of removing asbestos. Uh, from buildings that were be built before the Act. Uh, the next one is the Clean Water Act, which deals with water pollution. That was 1972. So you had Clean Air 63, you had Water, Clean Water in 1972. This one, as well as uh, the Clean Air Act, provide for criminal penalties. So you can see we're pretty serious as a society about this. Uh, we recognize the danger to us as people living on the earth. And so anytime you put a criminal penalty to, to some violation, as opposed to just a civil penalty, uh, it's, a, it's a serious matter that uh, Congress and we as a people have said needs to be dealt with, and people's conduct needs to be regulated accordingly. So you'll see here they developed standards. Uh, they're going toward, they started at manufacturers who were discharging pollutants into the water. And uh, if you know any of your history back in 
uh, the early industrialization of the country, a lot of times uh, factories were driven by water wheels that were driven by the streams and the waters and the rivers that flowed through the country. And so uh, a lot of the factories then were situated adjacent to water, uh, be it a, a lake or a, uh, most of the time rivers and streams. And they would just discharge the affluent, the unnecessary parts of the manufacturing process into the water. And so that's where the Clean Water Act came from, was that they wanted to deal with this discharge of uh, manufacturing waste uh, into, the, into the clean water. Um, ocean dumping, this is another statute, 1972. So you got Clean Water Act 72, you got ocean dumping. New York City, back in the 70s, had I don't know how many garbage barges and we're talking hundreds, because you know, there were nine, 9 million people living in New York at one time, back then at least, because I lived nearby. And they would uh, tug those barges out to sea, and I forget how far, but it wasn't real far, a few miles or so. I mean, they're not going to take it out there 12 miles, right? I mean, they're, they're doing this for a living. This is their business, so take it out out of sight and dump it. They were dumping millions of tons of garbage into the ocean right offshore. And the Ocean Dumping Act did away with that. Man, we're not going to do that anymore. Uh, oil pollution. There's now the Oil Pollution Act 1990. Uh, and I think the book talks about another statute. Uh, let me get, get over there. Another statute because of the BP oil spill in 2010. Uh, but the point being that now the Exxon Valdez, you may recall the Exxon, Exxon Valdez back in, I think it was 87 or so, ran aground in Alaska and uh, 10 million gallons of oil went out into the environment, killed all kinds of sea life, marine life, uh, put fishermen out of business for several years while they cleaned it up. Uh, likewise for BP in 2010 with their oil spill, which was bigger than Valdez. And uh, under this oil pollution statute 1990, they're required to clean it up. So not only clean it up, but also pay damages to all those who were injured by virtue of that. Uh, toxic chemicals, so just remember herbicides and pesticides that deal with our food and so forth, uh, requires that uh, certain standards for, for uh, how much they can be used and how often. And basically the test for herbicides and, and uh, pesticides is if science shows any connection to the po prospects of cancer or increasing the, the prospects of cancer, then they're going to ban that pesticide or greatly reduce its usage. But in most cases, they ban it. Okay, then you have the hazardous waste laws. Again, dealing with disposing hazardous waste. So a lot of times, you're, you're talking about, uh, new, you'll see nuclear material that has to be disposed of that is used in medicine, that sort of stuff. You'll see the little yellow symbol with the three triangles in red, and that's where they're having to get rid of the hazardous waste somehow. That also has uh, criminal penalties to it, <coughs> attached to it, and that can, provide fines up to $50,000 a day. Uh, but again, this is a cost of business. And the hazardous waste thing, because of uh, different types of materials coming out all the time, synthetic materials, uh, plastics and one thing or another, they're made from chemicals that we've been experimenting with to develop more products or what have you for, uh, for our society. Uh, the, the regulations continue to be expanded by the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, and it's a cost of business, and so it gets passed on to us. Uh, but that's just part of the price you pay to try to live in an environment that is more conducive to your health. Okay, and then last but not least is the Superfund. Uh, I'm at an hour and 45, so I'm going to wrap up. The Superfund, which was in 1980, that had to do with uh, dumping on the land, the subterranean land, the water tables. Uh, a lot of it was gas stations. We had, you know, we had thousands of gas stations around. And the ones that went into the ground in the 1930s and 40s, you can imagine, after 50, 60 years, they corroded. And the gas and the oil is leaking into the, into the subsoil and then into the water table and poisoning people. Uh, and so in 1980, we came up with a super fund that requires people who own that land to clean it up. Uh, and so any kind of manufacturing activity, a lot of times the manufacturing companies uh, they weren't near water because water was the easy way to get, dump it and the water carries it away or so you felt, so don't bother worrying about it. Well, if you were in 
inland a lot, like a lot of manufacturing in the middle of the country is. They would just dig big pits and dump the stuff into the water, into the into the round pits there, and the grass it would seep down. And so along came the Superfund that recognized that this was very very hazardous to the people because of our water table. And now owners are required to clean it up, and uh, and it's an extensive, very very expensive process. The most uh, uh, well known one around us here we. I live in North Irvine, and the El Toro Marine Base is only about four or five miles away. It's closed now; been closed for a number of years. You may recall they tried to turn it into an airport. Uh, I never got involved in politics very much or those kinds of things until that happened. Uh, since it was only going to be about four miles from my house, and the reality was they were going to have planes taking off and landing every three minutes, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and El Toro Marine Base was surrounded for miles by homes. It was all suburban residential everywhere. And uh, if you want to know the truth of how that all came about, and I'll wrap up, is Irvine's near Newport Beach. Newport Beach is a lot wealthier community than Irvine. John Wayne Airport, as some of you may know, is right there in Newport Beach. And the people in Newport Beach fought the expansion of John Wayne Airport since I've been here in 1978. They did not want it expanded. When I first came here, the terminal at John Wayne Airport was a little ramshackle single-story building that had three gates. You could park and walk, I mean literally park in a little dirt lot and walk down the street to go to the airport. And they did, and you see what we have there now, and they did not want that to expand. And so they saw the Marine Base as an opportunity to move everything down there. There are lots of reasons why it might might have been a good site. I mean, it had the longer runways and so forth. There were reasons why it shouldn't, but the biggest one was, is just the the it was a suburb, a, an upper class or upscale. I don't want to say upper class, but upscale uh, communities all around. Not to mention there was a, a leisure world down there that had 20,000 seniors living down there, and it was right under the flight path they were proposing. It took us 10 years to defeat that. The people from Newport Beach had so much money, and they had connections of one thing or another. And we finally got rid of it. But finally, get to my point, and I'll wrap up. Promise. El Toro Marine Base was was built during World, at beginning of World War II. So you're going back 1945. It was active until probably about 1990, uh, 92, 93. So we're going 50, 60 years. Well. They dumped jet fuel all over that place. It's, I think it's four or five thousand acres. It's a big, big base. I've been on it many times. They dumped jet fuel on it for 60 years. Now you can imagine what that subterranean soil is like, and yet they want to build homes on that. It's going to take years to clean that up, just years. So that's where the Superfund came from. That's why it's there. And I think the government's stuck with cleaning it up, by the way, but in any event. Okay, that does it. Again, my apologies for going so long. I get too long-winded, I know. Uh, anyway, again, uh, in fact, well, that's at the end of the lecture. I should have told you at the beginning. I would have cut this off, cut it off. But maybe I'll send you an email. I can listen to the last part fast. Uh, but anyway, I'll just want you to know both uh, protect, consumer protection and environmental. Know the major laws and what they stand for. And as I said, clean air, clean water, they're pretty simple, straightforward. And then look at the consumer protection ones and just know what they stand for, what they mean. I don't need to know the exact name. Uh, and in some cases, maybe the year is helpful, but not necessarily. Just what do they do? What do they do for, what do these laws do for consumers? And, uh, and what do the environmental laws do for all of us? That being said, I will sign off for the day and uh, get started working on the lecture next time. Uh, and uh, anyway, I wish you all a good week. And uh, if you have any questions on your research paper, please let me know. And I will uh, look forward to uh, exchanging emails and whatnot with you uh, during the week. And uh, see you again next week. Take care, everybody. Bye.